In this video, I'll teach you how to master Trade in Victoria 3 in a reasonable time frame. At its core, Trade in Victoria 3 is all about goods and people. The game lets you simulate the full range of goods and services used during this time period, representing them with specific values for quantity and price. By understanding how these goods move around the world, you can effectively manage your nation's economy and maximize its potential. I do want to note this is not a meta guide, so I will not be teaching you the most janky min-max strats. The purpose is to give you an understanding for the game and to enjoy it. Let's get started. Victoria 3 allows you to represent all goods and people in the time period in economic terms, represented by amount and price. The amount of a good in your market is based on what you produce and what you trade for through importing and exporting. The most important metric though is the good price. As this is the sole determining factor for your building's profitability, the investment pool gains, whether your pops can afford to buy enough of something, and whether you'll be able to keep factories open. We're going to deal with the trading aspect here, which is how you can deal with needed goods or excess goods in your market. Let's say you have an excess of 50 tools. You can either keep the excess, which makes them cheaper, or export them to another country to level out your price and gain some profit. If you have tariffs, aka a tax on goods sold or bought, you will directly make money on this trade route, but also make the goods less profitable for trade as the cost is factored into the final good price. On the other end of things, let's say that you have a deficit of 100 grain. You could spend construction power, time, and people, as well as increasing the power of the landowners by making them yourself, or you could import it from another country. Generally speaking, as with real life, you want to produce high-value goods for consumption and export and import the cheap ones. In the real world, what separates modern wealthy economies from those who are poor is really about how they are structured. Specialized high-tech economies outperform basic good producers every time, though it's much easier said than done, of course. The most important reason to trade is that it allows you to quickly gain access to resources you need without making them yourself. All you have to do is wait for the trade level to go up and you'll get access to a ton of hopefully cheap goods. There will not always be routes available to you, especially if it's at the beginning of the game or you're a really small country, but you can maneuver around this. Trade grows your economy quicker than anything else. Your GDP and building's profitability is based on the value of the good and its demand. Glass, for example, is incredibly valuable, but if you produce more and more of it, you'll run out of demand domestically, aka the POFs needs for your people and other buildings. By exporting it, you're able to find more demand and raise the price at home, which makes the buildings more profitable, and therefore the owners put their excess profits into your investment pool, which is incredibly valuable. Dependent diplomacy is also created when you make yourself so important to other countries' economies they cannot detach from you. Let's say you produce a ton of coal and tools as Prussia and export a ton of it to France. The French economy, if it was to stop receiving those goods in large amounts, would barely function due to how important they are for everything else. By making other countries reliant on your exports, you gain soft power over them. You can't move goods across water without ships, obviously. Almost all trade routes in Victoria 3 require convoys, besides overland ones, and even these may after a while. Each good type requires more or less convoys comparatively to move. In order to have a trade route increase its level and the amount of goods moved, you must have an excess of convoys. Do note here that the game may say you have an excess, but if it's less than the amount needed to increase the trade route level, it will not be enough. A route may need more than you currently have in surplus, and in order to level it up, you should have at least 200 convoys in surplus at all times if you can help it, if not more. It's also worth noting that the more sea trade nodes, aka distance, a trade route goes through, the more convoys are needed. Meaning trade across continents is costlier than trading to a neighbor, so you should always prioritize countries next to you or on a similar continent. Some trade is able to simply use land routes, Though after the 1.2 update, this has been changed. In the past, you could trade an unlimited amount of goods across borders, but now there is a limit on how much you can do before convoys are actually needed. This makes the innate power of countries like Russia not so extreme, but still incredibly poignant. Every trade route you create has a level, 
The levels of a route increase the amount of goods moved and convoys utilized. Trade routes are not static and will grow and recede due to profitability and capacity, which the level represents. If you have an excess of convoys and the route makes solid profit, it will grow and attempt to balance the good costs in both nations. If you or they lack the goods, lack convoys, or there are other trade routes with more profitability, it will not grow. Let's say it's early in the game and you have a ton of construction buildings, but lack the wood input needed for them. If you open a trade route with Russia to import wood, as it's much cheaper there and more expensive in your country, you will start to increase levels since you have the convoys needed, lowering the price of the good and increasing its quantity in your market. Competition in markets is key to being able to balance prices on a global scale. Sometimes two options will more or less be equally profitable, so the game needs a way to decide who to prioritize. This comes in the form of the trade competitiveness metric, which dictates how much of a share will be exported or imported in comparison to other options with an AI or player. Let's say the United States is trading with France and the UK for luxury furniture, and both profit about the same with the tariffs balanced. If France has 50% more trade competitiveness due to its stats than the United Kingdom, more of the luxury goods will go to France rather than the UK. This means that if you plan to do a lot of trading, you should not ignore this stat, though it's not always the most useful. Not the most important metric for trade, but it's important to understand this concept for more nuanced games, or especially multiplayer ones. Tariffs are the taxes a nation puts on trade. It is a complicated tool that can be understood simply. If you tax a trade good, you as the state make money off of it, at the cost of making it less competitive due to decreasing profit and impacting the price calculations for trade. Let's say you have a trade route for tool exports, which nets you a solid profit. If that route is subjugated to a 10% tariff, there are more costs on it, meaning it is less profitable as the buyer in another market will shoulder that cost. Without the tariff, the price of tools for importing, let's say would be 35, well below market price, which is lower than the other country you'd probably trade with. If you factor in the tariff of 10%, for let's say the basic mercantilist law, that makes the actual price the person trading for it of 38.5 before any of their tariffs. Perhaps the importer has an import tariff too of 10%. That means the final cost is in reality 42 instead of the original 35, making the good much more expensive than you would think. Victoria 3 is amazing at making one have to juggle the benefits and downsides of economic policy. If you go for, let's say, free trade, where you have no tariffs, it means most countries will love trading for your goods or letting you import them. But you make no money directly on the flow of goods, which is a lot of cost directly to your government, which could be going into other things. If you have high tariffs, you're able to make a lot of money on trade, but your market is much less competitive and overall less trading will likely be done. Generally though, as a player, it is key to understand that although tariffs may make you money, it has a very heavy cost. In fact, I'm gonna straight up say it, tariffs suck. Like they're really bad. After playing this game, I now understand the anger my economics professor had in college when talking about them in class with a look that would make you think they had killed his wife and her boyfriend. Where tariffs come from are your laws for trade policy, which vary in amount. You can see them by hovering over to get a better picture of what they actually do. Keep in mind that the default for them is the baseline tariff amount. You can lower and increase it for mercantilism and protectionism, though you cannot for the other two. These give you the ability to protect or open up certain goods of trade, which I think it's important enough to briefly cover here. Let's say you need more wood for construction, as you want to build more sectors or decrease the cost, which as always for construction is footed by your government and you directly. If you are mercantilist in your trade policy, you can protect your supply by going to the good menu in your market and clicking it. This will increase the cost for anybody wishing to trade for it with you. Before, a 10% tariff would make the good cost for trading, not taking into account any of the other person's tariffs, which they certainly will have, 51.4. After hitting the button, the cost is 65, which makes it incredibly unprofitable for people to trade for. Again essentially protecting your good. Current routes will drop levels and most countries will not be able to trade for it unless they just have insanely high costs for it in their own countries, which would result in them probably seeking other options anyway. Alternatively, 
Encouraging exports will remove any tariffs you have directly on that good while putting huge import costs for any country trying to export that good to you. Meaning you should hopefully be exporting more than importing and exporting a lot of it. Tariffs are a useful tool, but again, they are generally quite bad and you should try and get rid of them when you can. If you have low tariff laws like free trade, you're able to buy cheap goods from one country and with the reduced prices in your own market, resell it to other countries making the profit for yourself and increasing your trade centers and therefore income and investment pool contribution. Again, that's a key one. Keep that in mind. Many nations will not have the convoy and trade infrastructure needed to export a lot of their goods, especially in single player. If you build up a large convoy and trade route system, you can easily start to identify countries, especially those near you, to resell, making even better with trade agreements and trade competitiveness. Every trade route you start creates a trade center for each level. Trade centers are buildings that you cannot control yourself directly. They appear with trade lanes and can only be gotten rid of by removing the route directly. These buildings are very useful as they provide profit, urbanization, and migration attraction for the state at the cost of wages and a little bit of infrastructure. Where the center appear is semi-random with any area with a connection being made possible but normally it's coastal areas with ports in the capital being especially chosen. They are most useful when privately owned as their excess profit from the capitalists will be put into your investment pool, meaning you'll have more money to have buildings built in private construction. Very useful and with enough trade will really impact your game. Trade agreements are a diplomatic deal you can make with another country in the game. In order to get one, you'll need to have good diplomatic relations, as well as be trading a large amount of goods with the other country, if it's an AI, of course. A nation is unlikely to want to make a costly deal like this with countries they aren't a huge trade partner with. The benefit of the deal is that AI countries prefer trading with you over others, your routes cost no bureaucracy, and your routes are more competitive by a whopping 50%. Above all else, though, it is that it removes all tariffs from both parties in their trade routes, meaning the excess costs added to good values for trade from tariffs are just gone, which is very powerful for incentivizing trade and increasing profitability. It's worth trying to get these with large economies with a lot of cheap goods who can also buy huge amounts of produced goods mid to late game, like Russia, the Qing, France, United Kingdom, as soon as possible. As I mentioned before, texts do also impact trade heavily. Let's go over a couple of them here briefly. All production texts in the game help as you will have the edge on other producers in being able to make cheap goods at higher quantities and increase your profits adding to your investment pool. So these are always very key for trade and just your economy, of course, in general. The port texts on the left side of the military tree all give increased port levels in a state, which is great if you keep running out of ports and convoys especially for smaller countries with only a couple coastal regions. They also allow more in one area, so concentrating your routes through trading megacities becomes more relevant and doable. Gantry cranes and ironclads combined allow you to get industrial ports, which double your convoy output, as well as making your jobs use more advanced, such as machinists, which have, of course, a major impact on your politics, so we're not going to cover that here. This is massive, as you will start to run low on them unless you have tons of ports like the UK. Concrete dockyards give you modern ports, which again will double your convoys. International trade and stock exchanges are early techs, and you will normally have them. But if you start with no techs at all as a very small country, these are absolutely required to start trading, as most of your options are entirely locked behind them. All the far left techs in society increase your trade limit over land, meaning the amount of goods that can be traded over a land border before needing convoys. So that's useful too. And lastly, macroeconomics, which although a very late game tech is one of the better ones. It allows for way more goods to be traded in terms of quantity, which is very important, as well as giving you a nice little 25% competitiveness bonus on top of everything else. I want to take a moment to point out something that is important to understand while playing, especially in single player. The AI in Victoria 3 is unfortunately at present quite basic and will change their behavior unintelligently without mods like Anbeelds, which I'll go ahead and link here. If not, ping me, I may forget. If you create artificial supply and demand, it changes their perception of everything and your trading actions will impact them heavily. 
Let's say you don't have any wood as friends and are importing it from Russia with a trade agreement. This perpetually will keep the price of wood there high as long as you keep needing more, telling the Russian AI and economy it needs more wood. They take the price into account primarily and the trade deal will make it seem high for them. They'll keep making more and more wood to compensate for this. This gives the bonus of having another country do your dirty work and will stop them from industrializing. Let me explain briefly. If you had instead imported tools from them or glass or any other industrial good, they would produce more of them, adding more pops from those types of buildings, which would tend to be favoring the industrialists or the intelligentsia. Whereas those in a logging camp would either be completely politically disengaged, which laborers tend to be as pops, or they reinforce the old systems like the landowners. I use this to stress that your training and economy itself will cause a butterfly effect, especially as a big country, and change the whole game politically and economically, which is really cool. But it's also worth understanding, and this is a warning. With great power comes great responsibility. Related to this is the effect of the automatic or private construction portion of your economy, which is so important now. The investment pool, which is added to over time from profits, from capitalists primarily, but a few others as well, they're the best at it, automatically build buildings, which you do not get to choose yourself. Just because you don't pick them doesn't mean you can't influence them or nudge them in the right direction. They will always prioritize profitable goods, as it is run from capitalists who seek the highest return on investment possible. This means the goods that are most expensive will be prioritized in the building queue from private construction. Let's use the wood example again from AI behavior. Importing the wood from the Russian AI impacts that country greatly, but it also changes yours. By having the price of wood be balanced and optimally decreased, you will have a lower chance that logging camps will be built in your nation from capitalists, which is a good thing, as opposed to not importing that wood where the private construction would compensate from your lack and the higher price. Buildings have pop changes, which affects your politics and wealth, even standard of living. So things you choose to build, as well as trade for, impact your private construction and therefore investment pool, as it all comes back into that. Keep this in mind always. Lastly, I know this has been long, it's been long for me, and I'm sure it's long for you, but this is important to understand, is treaty ports. These are prizes gained through wars with other powers that let you take a tiny piece of their land. Why do this and not just take a whole area? Well, it's the infamy, because instead of taking a whole chunk and all that infamy, you get very little infamy and are able to get access to the market over land and giving all the bonuses attached. Being next to them decreases convoy costs massively and makes the countries there be more willing to trade with you. I hope this tutorial helped you understand trade in Victoria 3. Any questions or clarification needed, please leave a comment and I will do my best to answer it in a reasonable time frame. I'll be putting out a series of Victoria 3 tutorials covering the main components of the game in a reasonable manner and as short of a time frame as I can get it. So go ahead and check those out in my channel if you're interested. I also have a roleplay series out, or rather quite a few of them for Victoria, so you can check those out if you'd like as well. And I stream on Twitch. Catch you all soon.